Hey guys, I just got back from the Tulsa show and let me tell you what I learned. So I haven't been to the Tulsa show in over five years. I went a couple of times. It was, it's a lot of work because there's no direct flight and it took all day to get there, spend two or three days on a concrete floor talking to people and then a whole day to get back. But I always heard people say Tulsa show is one of the best in the world. It's one of the biggest. I will say the Tulsa show is huge. Walking that show, you get exhausted. And one of the best parts of the show is meeting some of you. Now, I did have people come by and a lot of them just came by to say hello. Uh, a lot of them bought books and things like that. If you look up at the ceiling, you can see how long this is. This is actually the width, but then it's as long as a football field going the other way and there's two levels. So you can walk all day and just look at guns, which is really a lot of fun. And so I would have people come by and you can see our table there because you can see the tablecloth says Legacy. Most of the people came right over because they knew Legacy was there. But one of my favorite things is when people just kind of look at me and they squint their eyes and they stare for a minute and then they and I, I point to them and I say, YouTube. And then it, the, and you see the light go off and they say, oh, you're the guy on YouTube. So probably they weren't prepared to see me, but when they saw me, they were like, oh, Legacy's here. We even have some of the youths. I talk about the younger people coming out to the show. We're getting a lot of teenagers and, 20, and people in their 20s. Uh, this guy was showing us an Egyptian rifle, which was very rare, and he had it for sale at the show. Then I had these two dudes come by, maybe two cowboys, I don't know, but gotta be from Oklahoma or Texas. And I told them, if you are in this video, you're going to be hit up by chicks constantly. But they went ahead and braved it anyway and agreed to be in the video. Now, most of my time is spent at the table. I do try to walk the show, especially people uh, call my cell and say, hey, come here, I wanna show you something. So I'm walking the show, but most of the time is behind the show. And there's just a lot of people coming by just to say hi. And in walking the show, what I've noticed is, like at the show of shows, it's all military and collectible guns. This is less than half military and collectible guns. There's a lot of modern guns, there's tactical gear, um, Glocks, AR-15s, uh, there's even some beef jerky and some jewelry, uh, a little bit for everybody. The booth right next to me had a lot of bunch of fireworks. This gentleman is Mitch and he actually helps Legacy out. He doesn't actually work for Legacy as an employee, but he does uh, work as a picker, meaning he goes to the show and picks things up for us. And then April was with him and she actually helped out at the table. Thank you to both of them who helped us at the show and boy, that I need it. Oh, and then uh, one of my new friends, Lewis, came by and you can see that police Luger. He gave that to us uh, to consign. He was just saying that he would like to consign a few guns. So that is on its way to us. I shipped it back to myself since I flew. I couldn't bring it back, but I shipped some guns back to myself and we will be adding that one to the site soon. And then finally, uh, Jacob came by. Uh, he's been a longtime viewer. He has a really nice collection and was looking for something in particular. And I told him I'd keep an eye out. I can't tell you what he's looking for because then all of you will want to talk to him. Uh, in the background there, the guy with the orange hat, he is Evan. Uh, who works in our Ohio office. Okay, so when I finally did get away from the table and actually people would come get me and say, hey, come here, I want you to look at something. I saw something really unusual. This is one of the things that somebody said, you gotta come take a look at this. So this, you look at it, it's a Luger holster. It went to the police. You can tell by the, the closure strap. But what's interesting about it, and you don't notice it right away because the closure strap and some of the other uh, parts are leather, but this is actually a paper Luger holster. Now, I am not new to paper holsters. We do see a lot of paper holsters with PPs and PPKs, HSCs, the small caliber pistols. You will see paper holsters. Oh, and even P38s, paper holsters, which basically they take sheets of paper, uh, they put glue between each sheet and they make a material that really is fairly durable, but over time the paper begins to separate or spread out and you can actually see that you can count the layers of paper. But I don't think I've ever seen a Luger paper holster because all the paper holsters are late worn, meaning they were running out of pigskin, they were running out of uh, leather. 
And so they were looking for a material. So the end of the war, usually 43, 44, and certainly 45, you'll see paper holsters, but not with Lugers because Luger production, as you know, you read my book, they stopped production in 1942. Mauser stopped production in 1942. So this gentleman said, I have a paper Luger holster. You open it up and you can see the tool pouch is made of leather. You can't really see the paper in terms of separating yet because this is in such good shape, but you can see kind of the wrinkles in it and you know something is odd about this holster. It is a paper holster. And when I turn it over and look at the back, I can see the police eagle, which is very distinct, and the date, which is stamped in there. And indeed, it is 1943. Now, those belt loops, by the way, are leather, and the rest of it is paper. And so we have a paper leather holster from 1943. What's it worth? I don't know, but I learned something new in that I found a paper holster. I didn't buy it because it was with a gun. I believe it sold uh, before the end of the day, uh, but people were talking about it. Now, I also saw this holster, which goes to a PP. Um, the owner said, have you ever seen a holster like this before? And indeed, I have actually seen one before, and, I, and it was many years ago. I haven't seen one since, so this is probably the second I've seen. And I believe I was told it was Swedish. Now, some of you out there will uh, happily correct me if you're from Sweden or you know holsters better than I do. This looks like a Swedish holster. If you look inside, you can see that the Walther PP fits very nicely. Uh, yes, the closure strap needs to be repaired. Uh, but you can see the PP and it fits in there perfectly. And then when we look at the back, it has these unique belt loops, which uh, uh, have the metal loops on them. Uh, that would be for uh, fit on your belt, but also for a shoulder strap. So correct me if I'm wrong, if you know, uh, this I believe is a Swedish commercial holster and goes with the Walther PP. Next, I wanna show you some guns that I saw at the show. Uh, this is actually one that came by to my table. Here's what's remarkable. Here's what a typical RZM looks like. I take one out of my safe and the RZM marking looks like this. Guy came by my table and says, uh, what do you think of this RZM? I will tell you that RZM marking is the clearest I've ever seen. It's interesting because it's reverse frosted, meaning usually, well, if you look at the logo, you can see that the uh, letters are all etched in and in the white, but on the logo, the RZM marking is black and the background is in the white. So we call that a, a frosted background RZM marking. I saw this at the show. He was not selling it or I would have bought it, uh, but that is probably the best RZM marking, the clearest I've ever seen. Now, the biggest thing that I learned at the show came from these two radums. Now, bear in mind, I'm in the, a gun show. The lighting is not good. I'm on top of somebody's table. Uh, usually they have glass. I'm setting it on the glass. So I apologize for the pictures. They're not very well focused, but uh, there is a lot to learn from these two radums. And this was the highlight of my show, except of course, from meeting some of you. If you're in the video, I enjoyed meeting you the most. Second most, love these radums. Take a look at these. These are sequentially numbered. The radum in the foreground, by the way, I know in Europe and certainly in Poland, they call it the viz. So the viz or the radum, you can see the prefix is Z. Now, if you watch my video about radums, you know that they went from no suffix, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z. And at Z, they simplified the production and went back to no suffix and A, B, C, D again. So they went back, they got rid of the third lever. Uh, here's a picture of the three levers. So the Z block would have been a transitional block because not only did they start the alphabet all over again, but they removed one of the levers. And the lever here in the Z block, you can see the, the three lever. Here's lever one, lever two, lever three. Now. Two of them are safety levers and one of them is a takedown lever. And again, transition was from the Z block and when they started the letters all over again. In my mind, when I'm ever looking at a radum, of course the early features will be, it'll be slotted, it'll have a high polished finish, but we go A to Z and then once they went back to A again, that's when they removed the lever because that's nice and clean. But you can see here in the Z block, you can see 1566 with the Waffenproof and then the one behind it is 1567. So sequentially numbered, one has black grips, one has red grips. So people say, when did they do the transition? Well, here's a, 
uh, living proof that right around this period of time, for, uh, it's certainly in the Z block, and I, I know I have seen red grips before that, but in the Z block, they took away one of the levers. They started using red grips and did away with some of the black grips. They actually had a wooden grip toward the end. But I think the coolest thing, as I thought about it, and we were talking about it at the table and people were gathering around, here it is sequential. The one before it has the later feature, and the one after it has the early feature. So um, it, it's not logical. So when I think of an assembly line, I think first in, first out, and I think of Lucy with the candy, and they're coming down the line, and they always went in sequential order. Here's what I learned at this show. Here is absolute proof that they all didn't always do it in exact sequence. Now this is the later of the consecutive number has the early features, so clearly they were working probably in different workstations, almost like little cubicles. Uh, the guns parts were uh, put together, they were inspected, and a workman, uh, uh, unfortunately a lot of times slave labor, would be putting these together. In this case, somebody had the earlier feature and put it together and got it done before the other guy got it done. So uh, basically they're not always in exact sequence. So for those of us who actually write books, um, I will give a serial range, and this happens all the time. I get a serial range and somebody says, I have one of those variations, but it's 20 numbers later. Is mine a fake? Well, I can always say there's always anomalies. There's always out of sequence guns. Here's an example at the show that I saw of a no date. Now, the P38 no date is a very rare variation. It's because they went from the 480 code to the AC code, and then they realized they wanted to put a date. So for a very short period of time, they did AC with no date. And here is an AC no date that the serial number is 3476A. Now, I don't have all of my serial numbers memorized, but when I was at the show and I looked at it, I thought, there's no such thing as an AC no date in the A block. And those of you who are on the P38 forums and you study P38s, this gun should not exist. They stopped the no date somewhere in about 9900. So I think it goes, AC no date goes up to 9975. And somewhere at 9999, they went back to 1A, 2A, 3A. This one is more than 3400 uh, serial numbers later, you have an AC no date. Now that kind of out of sequence doesn't seem possible, and yet here it is. I see no signs of the 40 being removed. I see no signs of fakery. I know some of you will look at this and say, it's a fake. Well, to be honest, there are people who love these kind of guns because they're oddballs, and some people like these oddball guns. By the way, my opinion is that this gun was being put together, the 40 should have been added, but the guy got interrupted, you know, his cell phone went off and he got a text, so he quick picked it up. Next thing you know, it moved on down the line. That was a joke and he never added the 40. Here's what the AC 40 added looks like. And then this is the AC no date, well into the range where it should have been added and it wasn't. I started to say some people like these oddball guns and others of you, and I tend to be more this way, if it's not according to the book, it might be worth less. So a lot of times I will avoid it. But every once in a while, I see something really cool. And even though it's a factory error or it doesn't fit the books, I like it anyway. Like this Walder Banner upside down. I just loved it. I've actually found like four or five of these and I've had no problem. I just make one phone call and somebody will buy it. And I think the same is true of this AC no date. Uh, with the 40 missing, I think somebody's gonna just love it and um, it'll sell very easily. Okay, I know you wanted to see more guns than that, but you know what? We have to wait till the mail arrives. I got back faster than the guns arrived. So I'm assuming I will get them by tomorrow and maybe before the end of the week, I'll show you part two of what I found at the Tulsa show. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned something because I learned something just going to the show. <music>